Good morning, everybody. Today's episode is with the artist Shad Chalice. Awesome human being, super talented artist. It's raining today, which is super fun. But uh, we're going to go hang out at a record store and um, go to the Swedish Art Institute. Gluten Free Chicken, episode number six. Every day. Chad, how are you? What's up, buddy? How are you, sir? Well, I made sure it was nice and rainy. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. yeah beautiful. At least we're not strolling outside in the meadow or something. You know, I just wanted it to match your kind of dark, <laughs> you know. Usually he's wearing, like, you know, dark makeup. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. I usually get but the... thanks for not doing the goth today. <laughs> the guy, guy liner. Yeah. yeah. I'm uh, ready whenever you are. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Going for it straight away. Huh? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> And then it's push button start. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. I grew up in Maryland. Uh, I moved out from Maryland. I moved to California and worked in movies. Uh, I went to art school and film school. Art school first, film school next. And then uh, ended up on movie crews and such like that. Worked in Maryland on in Baltimore and movie crews. And I followed a crew out to California. I worked on uh, the Donnie and Marie talk show. You remember Donnie Marie Osmond? They had a talk show for like one season. That's when I first learned what edamame is. <laughs> I remember someone asked me, okay, I said, well, what can I get for you? She's like, oh, God, be I'd love to get some edamame. And I was like, absolutely. I will definitely get that for you. I don't, I don't know what that was, but uh, figured it out. I worked out there. I was all set up out there. Two of my oldest friends are Mark and Jojo from Wookiee Foot. I've known those guys since I was 14, 15. Well, they lived in Oregon at that time, you know, just up the coast from California. So I went and visited them up in Oregon. They were just starting the band. <laughs> they were like, we're going to relocate. They're like, Oregon's blown out. We already, we already conquered Oregon. They, they literally did. Like their first gig was like to 1500 people or something. It was crazy. And so they're trying to pick a new city to go to. Originally they were going to Florida, but any way that they went, they were going to drive right past me. So I was like, well, you gotta come right by here, we'll have a big party. We had a giant party, and they pulled the school bus into my <laughs> my little setup in, in California. I hopped on the bus with them, like three weeks on the school bus, driving across. So that was that. I mean, like, that's a whole other story, that whole ride to across country on the school bus. I mean, that could take all day. So it's kind of like reforging all these these friendships and meeting new people and, and being like, this is like important. Like, these are like your, like your core crew here. I didn't know where they're gonna land. I figured they land in Florida. What I end up hearing is they're in Minneapolis. Was not on the radar for a place for them to go, you know. And they're like, we found this amazing house. We need $8,000 by Friday. That was the playhouse. And he's literally making phone calls to every person he's ever met, anyone he ever know, and said, we need to get this house. And the guy wanted first, last, and security deposit. So it was eight grand by Friday. And I think they had, together they had two, so they need to make $6,000 in like four days. How are you gonna raise that? I had some money, I gave him 500 bucks. My dad gave him 500 bucks. That 500 bucks would go towards rent if you wanted to come out and stay. And that's what he was kind of trading. You know, oh, okay, so you put up $1,000 basically. You could come out in the summer and we'll give you a room. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's kind of, that's kind of a cool little trade off. And that's what happened, um, came out thinking I'd be here for a month, maybe. Then the, the show got canceled in the middle of that. So yeah, I had a choice to make, you know? I mean, I was literally sitting in an amazing spot with amazing people. And I remember thinking, this is a moment of choice between the best friends of your life over money, success. I chose people and friends over the job. Are you an artist? Are you? Yeah, it's, I mean, I always, I always kind of lean on the jack of all trades line. <laughs> jack of all trades, master of none. That is kind of my thing is that I have so many different interests and abilities. My issue is that I can never choose 
or stick with one at any for any <laughs> length of time. One of the big things I did realize here was there's a lot of community people around that you can you can shake that tree and find whatever you need. You're an editor, you need this, you need that. What better place to meet all those people than at the playhouse, that building. And we made that a hub. We made that a spot for people to come to. And then from that point, everybody's particular talent or whatever they were looking for and needing to fill got filled. We need a band. Whole band moves in next door. Just when you needed something, it would get provided because we all sort of believed in it. It was like, you believe in it and it shows up. Should we go inside? Sure. Yeah, let's go inside. Yeah, well, like, what, I was, like, what I was saying about that is, I was thinking about this and if you, if you're in the middle of making an art piece and you, you know exactly where it's going, you're pretty much doing it wrong. You know, because the way I see it is, it's a collaborative thing to have the meaning of the, the piece. You need the audience to do as much work as you're doing. Not, not to say that it should be work to view art or understand art, but if you're the only one participating in it as the artist, you're like, I'm telling you and showing you, look at this. It's a one note thing. It's very simple. It's simplistic. It's so simple. Everyone either gets it or they don't. And, it, and once they do, I got it. That's not the way I see it. I mean, especially my style of art, which is like very, it's collage art, it's pop art, it's, uh, it's referential art. So how could I possibly cut you as the viewer out of that? It literally is taking something that already exists for one purpose, like pre-printed materials, ads and photos and pictures and posters and whatever, flipping them upside down, ripping them up, repurposing them. But they still sort of have their original intention behind them. And now they're a new thing. Well, once that gets all like swirled and convoluted and laid on top of each other, how could I keep that straight? I need to trust where it's going, trust that there's inherent meaning in there, but really you as the viewer fill in the gaps. If I leave enough open space in, in each one of those pieces, it could mean something different for you. It's sort of like with a song. If like, uh, if the lyrics are poetic instead of literal, then it leaves a little room for everyone to interpret it the, and then relate to it. Anytime I've ever made an art piece that was a purpose, like a literal like message, it didn't work as well. I have artistic training. I understand color and composition and how things go together and such, but I don't want to control that too much. I want to lean on it, use my own way of seeing things. But as soon as you lean too far into, I know the right way, and I'm gonna show you something. It falls right off the edge. It's just like a song. If a song is too literal, it's never gonna be like this timeless thing. So it goes back to that whole like trusting something when you don't really know. You know, and that's what moving here was like too. Same thing when I'm placing something in an art piece. It's like, I don't know, if I do this, if I, if I put this big sticker over this section that I already did. I already spent like a whole like four hours on this little section, but I think it needs to get a big sticker over top of it. You got to trust that. I, I will have made all these decisions. I'll make like decisions like putting that sticker on it or ripping this in half and sticking this and then all of a sudden be like, well, I got to spray paint a big line across it. And then literally I'll back up from it and I can, I can just have an inherent feeling of like when it's done and then I'll back up and then I can become the viewer. And see it for what it is, and try to figure out how do these things connect? Is there meaning? What's the deeper meaning? Just like poetry. I know, it, I know English, I know what all the words mean, but what do they mean to you? How do those words connected, how do those resonate in your brain? What does that say to you? If you don't have that little open space for someone to put in their own sense of meaning, it's gonna be a one note thing. It's not gonna be good enough. And that's the way I've always seen it. And I, I love that feeling of like backing up from it and going like, okay, well, did this work? Did, what's, is there any meaning in this? And then all of a sudden I'll be like, wow, I didn't even think that using that and that and that, those actually do relate with a, a deeper meaning, not just color. I didn't realize I was choosing stuff from color and composition and, uh, and form. I was also choosing it for content on instinct, you know? It, but you have to like keep yourself in the dark about that. You have to like willingly turn that part off enough to let that flow out. Because if you do it on purpose, then you're then you become pretentious. Then you're like purposely, 
I'm purposely leaving some space for you, the viewer, but I'm actually, it's a really tricky thing to just be able to, to like do that when I know I have to do it, <laughs> but I can't do it consciously. It's like this constant feeling of sort of tricking yourself into it, sort of like believing in it and riding that line because so many people, it's so easy to fall into that pretentious, like, I know what I'm doing. Oh, look how deep that title of my song is, you know? Art in general, oh my God, art has the, is the king of that. You know, like, buttery pancake sprawl number six, you know, and you're just like, really? Come on. In the music world, you definitely, you run into people who are like, they want to get into making music, and the first couple things they do, they're like, <laughs> it's so like weird and goofy because they don't understand the rules of music. Right. I think that's the same thing with art, right? Absolutely. Like the first time someone paints, you're like, oh, I see where you were going, but you don't understand like composition yeah. and you have to have some sort of training. Right. And like you say, like tricking yourself into being like, oh, I'm not like a pro, I'm going to make this a compositional da 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 da. Mm -hmm. Like I know the rules enough to know. Yeah that the rules are there and I'm, I'm doing them right? Right. Yeah. I think so. I think, I think there is an aspect of... <laughs> I think there's an aspect of practice. You have to sort of know what came before you so that you don't just completely fall into this like, oh wow, I just discovered that G, D, and A go together. And you're like, Buddy. <laughs> Buddy. <laughs> you should have really listen to some songs but before I mean, you write some, you know. So art without intention though, is that really art? This is what I'm, I guess I'm saying is like someone, if you don't know your history and if you don't study it a little bit, you'll end up falling into, wow, check out these, these I'm going to splatter some paint. And you're like, okay, well we already been over that. It, it's really tricky. Be, you know, somebody like Murphy, for example, I'm blown away that he doesn't really listen to music. Obviously he knows a lot about music. But if I were a musician, I would think I would want to like really be knowing what's going on so that I first don't copy it or fall into it like two years too late. Be like, oh, I'm really at a trap now. Like I just discovered dubstep. And you're like, okay, well, because you didn't keep up, now you're actually behind. This is one of the stories I always think about in terms of art and commerce. The artist who did, who worked for, worked with Pink Floyd forever, like he was hired by the record company. You know, he was on retainer or something with them. Some producer realized that this guy, this artist, he's quirky and weird. We don't know what to do with him he should work with these guys. And he forced them together. And Pink, I remember hearing this in an interview, Pink Floyd literally said, we don't know anything about it. We don't have a really an opinion about our visuals. Music speaks for us. We have to have an album cover. Go for it. You do it. You know, like we'll give you something to listen to obviously. And if you want to talk to us about it, we can, but it should speak for itself. And you're the artist. Make, make your thing. It took somebody to have the vision of putting those two guys together, but then it took somebody that could let go, you know, and like not like, like detach from, from being connected to, you know, controlling every aspect of everything, you know, like as a band, that's what everyone wants to do nowadays. Like you, we were saying before, it's like, well, you don't have any aptitude in this, you know, like maybe you should trust that an artist can hear what you're saying, and express themselves that way. I mean, that, that's iconic, right? Yeah. They didn't even, they didn't, they didn't care. They didn't have anything to do with that. They didn't even like it. From what I heard, they were like, eh, that's weird, okay, well, whatever. And he had like this relationship with them over the course of, you know, however many years. But I always remembered that as like, it's a good lesson to, to entrust, you know? For example, moving when I first moved out here with the band, you know, it was like, we had to, 
have flyers. You know, we had, back then you had to flyer to get him to come to your show. You had, and you'd have to come up with something weird and cool every month. And they had a standing uh, show at the Quest. Every month we'd have to come up with a stage show and a flyer and ad in the city pages or, you know, whatever. And that was like what I would do. But it was really collaborative. Like everybody was in that house. And then like, all right, what do we do? Yeah, you did this art, didn't you? I didn't do this cover, but I did the back. And uh, I had to match. We had this image from an artist that we know named Ben, and they really liked it. And then he's like, JoJo's like, oh, I want to see what he's seeing. So I had to draw this guy <laughs> to match his style. This one, if you could get into it, we went all out. Like, it's a nine panel, like, lyrics fold out and a poster on the back. The crazy cool thing about that particular CD was that Mark actually like trusted me the same way Pink Floyd artist was trusted. That particular album, he was like, show me what you got. What was so crazy about it is he didn't have any of the uh, songs weren't done yet when I was doing that. At least he didn't play them for me because he wasn't quite ready to let them out. But I, I had all the lyrics because I had to lay out the lyric sheet. So when I did it, the idea was to pull out certain phrases or, or words from songs and make them a graphic display for it that would go behind the lyrics. So I pulled out like certain phrases from each song without hearing the songs, just reading the lyrics. And I would have never chosen the ones I chose if I had heard the songs. It was so cool. It was like this really cool like um, exercise of like, reading it on the page, these words jumped out at me. But they were like, you can't even tell that he's, that he's saying that in the song, but it jumped out, like certain ones, you know, just jumped out at me. And I made them like the feature part of the, of the lyric page. And I remember Mark just being like, wow, that's so weird. I would have never chosen those. I was like, I probably wouldn't have either if I'd heard the songs, but it was just the way it, it culminated the way it happened. And now it's just special. There's something cool about that. And, you know, to his credit, he went with it. He didn't make me change it. He didn't say, well, you should go back and listen to him. And now how would you do it? You know, good idea. Let's do it right or something. <laughs> he trusted it, you know. And that was like the one that we did the most, like that was the biggest, most ambitious layout, you know. Definitely proud of that one. That one was really. What, what's next for you? <laughs> what do you do now? Like what's. <laughs> Creatively, I'm actually just getting sort of back into my collage art trying to find a way to get motivated with that. Like, give yourself some parameters. So like the idea of like, okay, I'm gonna get one art piece done a week or something like that. And it's cool to, if you can do that and put it out there in this group, it really does resonate. Like there's a guy named Matthew Dennison, been around in this crew forever. Recently, I saw him. I've known him for 15, 20 years. I've never known him to be a visual artist. And he was like, I'm gonna get back into this. And he just like charged it, bought a bunch of paints and canvases and just started going for it. And then posted it all out there and said, I'm doing this now. It was inspiring to me. Like, I don't know that aspect of him. And the fact that he's out there sharing that and he's giving himself a goal. Like, I'm gonna make an art piece every week and I'm gonna show it to you guys. It's working, it's resonating for him. I wanna get back to my, to my art and combine it with a way to like get it out there. And I'm doing, trying to do weirder things. Like my collage stuff is like kind of less specific. It's a little bit ethereal and weird. How do I get that out there? What do I do with that? I was like, what if I print that onto lunch boxes? What if I, what if I make uh, phone case skins? What if I do laptop skins? Can I do that without having them manufactured? Can I make those myself? Can I print my collage onto the shrink wrap stuff that you put on cars and then actually shrink wrap it myself onto the lunch boxes go find old ass lunch boxes at a thrift store and like put half of my stuff on it and half the old lunch box you know like how do i make something that's repeatable sellable but hasn't lost its its spark its soul easy right come yeah, on oh that my shouldn't God, be so hard so <laughs> sure you can make a one-off art piece you gotta find a way to combine those those two things you know 
So yeah, that's what I'm sort of focusing on now. I love to collaborate with people in terms of like photos, headshots. I think I'm gonna be shooting a music video with Mercedes Valentine. Love that shit. I mean, that's literally what Amy and I do. She brings her idea and her drawings and we figure out the stage show every year in my backyard and we paint it and build it and figure that shit out. There's always something, you know, and there's always like a, some new thing I'm interested in doing, you know, always trying to make my house better because that's kind of like my my hub I like having parties I like having people come over and you know make that sort of a hub so I'm always working on that really always happy to have that and I'm always kind of focused on that